Can you hear us? Can you Can over? Me, we are sinking. We are sink. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. How are we all doing? It's me, Legal Vices, and today is Maritime Monday. I hope uh, I hope you found the introduction a little a little humorous and got a little chuckle out of it. Uh, it's the usual one we always do, but uh, I hope you I hope you found it extra amusing today because um, that's probably about the last laugh we're going to have today. This is a this is a really really deep and amazing case. We we've done the Penley lifeboat disaster case before. Uh, it was it was one of the early Maritime Monday things we did, but you may remember that. We also did a uh, an episode about the Batavia, one of the well, it was the first n- n- ship to arrive on Australian shores uh, a few hundred years ago. It ended disastrously, but to help us out with that show, we had a couple on here, uh, Jeffrey Peters and his wife from Retired Afloat. Uh, they're an amazing Australian couple that have have decided to live their dream. Where half of the year they uh, they sail around the world in their own boat wherever they want to go, and the other half of the world they uh, they sail aboard cruise ships, giving lectures about uh, maritime incidents. And one of the one of the lectures they gave was about the Penley lifeboat disaster, and they gave it about eight months ago. Is when they uploaded the video, and I, I really really want to revisit that. And the reason I want to revisit is one because it's a, it's just a spectacular video. Uh, and I've been waiting to put some distance between me and the first time we did it. Um, but also it's the anniversary. The anniversary passed. I thought about doing doing this uh, on the anniversary, which was December 19th, 1981. But then I thought, you know, it's, that's awfully close to Christmas. We don't we don't want to do it, a, a story like that around Christmas, uh, especially if, you know, for some reason, somehow family or relatives or whatnot are watching. And then uh, nobody wants that for New Year's either. So finally, this is the earliest slot we could find. So we're going to be watching that today. Um, we've got the, the the dogs are over here snoring already. So if you, if you hear them, if you hear the, the snoring, snuffing, heavy breathing, that's the dogs, not me. Um, gosh. Again, uh, it's kind of hard to segue into this story because it's it's very, very heavy. Uh, but the the heroism of everybody involved um just i mean it's second to none it's there's there's sort of two maritime related stories that really for some reason i have no connection to either of them but these two stories there's they just somehow speak to something inside my core uh that just it's always I mean, it's hard to watch or, or listen to do anything that has anything to do with these two. One is the uh, Edmund Fitzgerald, and two is the Penley lifeboat disaster. For some reason, there's just something about these stories that 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 touch me differently than than other other stories do. But before we get going, let's take care of all the housekeeping stuff. First, coming up tomorrow, let's give it a little run through for the rest of the week. Coming up tomorrow, we've got uh, more. We're going to deep, deep dive some documents in the Clayton. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was called by my old friend's name. The Clayton Eckerd and uh, Jane Doe case. The, he's the case of The Bachelor, who's been accused of uh, impregnating this young lady with twins via oral pleasure. Uh, you know, but there's some big developments in that. She wants to withdraw the lawsuit. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. There's too much. We've gone on too far. Now I need to clear my name and I'm not letting you withdraw it. That's happening on Tuesday. Wednesday, we're going to have Greg Anderson, Maya Kowalski's lawyer is going to be on. Thursday, we're going to be continuing our uh, Johnny Cochran closing arguments in the O.J. Simpson trial. And Friday, we're going to have Legal Vice's Lady Bits, the F at Friday, Griftathon, Boozy Griftathon with an all-female, all-amazing female panel. Don't miss that. Uh, we'll talk about that more at the end. But right now, head on, go head on over here and hit the like and subscribe buttons. 
you know what to do. We got 163 of you here, 92 likes, about 50 of you haven't done your job. Well, okay, so maybe 70 of you haven't done your job, <laughs> but get down there and do it. And take our like and subscribe poll because your likes and your subscriptions do mean things to me. I never take a single one of them for granted, and it really lets YouTube uh, kind of know what's going on here. Uh, today's like and subscribe poll, which is just, just specifically to remind you to do that. What are you looking for in Maritime Monday streams? Are you looking for cannibalism, heroism, happily ever after stories, and uh, or a good mix of everything? Ch take your take your take your time, take a vote, <laughs> and we'll check it out in about an hour, and then again at the end of the show to see what you what you guys are looking for in Maritime Monday streams. Okay, well, again, here's the here's the segue into the the difficult part, which is everything else. The uh, the RNL, it's the Royal Navy Lifeboat Institute. They they essentially man they're they're the they're the, uh, the British Coast Guard as well as you know, as the you know, all of Ireland. Uh, they're essentially volunteer volunteer life you know, like uh, Coast Guard people. They have the lifeboat stations where people are just ordinary everyday people going about their business, doing doing their thing. They go to work, they go to sleep. They have their own jobs, and then a disaster happens, and these volunteers are called into service. And they they have their lifeboat stations where they launch their lifeboats, and they go out and voluntarily risk their lives to save people out on the sea. Which, just in and of itself, anyone that volunteers for that sort of thing of fight, being a fireman, coast guard, life, we, I mean, that's a special, special breed of person. If you're, especially if you're not getting paid for it. You're volunteering to risk your life for people you have no idea who they are. And that's that's sort of the gist of the story today. The, uh, the Penley Lifeboat Station. It was forever changed. What did I say? I said Royal National Lifeboat Institution, didn't I? Oh, did I say Naval? Oh, I'm sorry. I misspoke. <laughs> I, I I absolutely misspoke. It, it is not naval. It is national, and it's it's all public funded. It's 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 amazing. It's an amazing group. You should go to the, the I think it's rnli.org, I believe is their homepage. I mean, it's just, it's, it's fantastic what they do. Uh, sorry, I, I misspoke there. I meant Royal National. <laughs> I said for some reason I guess I had the Royal Navy on the brain, but anyway, everything changed. For the, the Penley Lifeboat Station and the surrounding village on December 19th, 1981. Most people, before we get going, uh, need to know that we have the uh, monthly memberships and some other things here. We've got uh, Silver Crypto 2022, who's joined the Clean and Sober crew. We've got Big Daddy's sister in law, who's also a new member of the Clean and Sober crew. And Lauren Vogt, Vogt. Uh, Lauren became a YouTube member. Thank you so much for joining the Clean and Sober crew yourself. And Nancy Jo M has been a member for 11 months. So is excited to catch Maritime Monday live. Well, I'm excited to, you can catch it live too. Uh, not the most cheerful, but it is one of the most heroic Maritime Mondays you're ever going to hear about. So let's let's go back there to 1981. If you're in the village, you probably were aware of what was going on. If you didn't live in the village, there's a good chance that you didn't hear anything about it. And the next day, you wake up to and turn on the news. And what's on the news? Long before midnight last night, rescue services feared the worst. The lifeboat Solomon Brown already out of radio contact three hours. And before that, Coast Guards had heard the Union Star failing to come to terms with a tug offering a tow. But all night they toiled, led by neighboring lifeboat crews, lifelong friends of those aboard the Solomon Brown. We went in, but in the dark, uh, we went. Now, the Solomon Brown is the, that, that is the uh, Penley lifeboat. That's the name of the lifeboat. Uh, Go right in close to the shore. The sea was very heavy running running in. Uh, in case there should have been any survivors just off the shore, we've searched, but uh, we haven't found anything. And you're going back out again? Going back at daylight, yes. 
and daylight found Coxman Mitchell moving through the settling sea, the start of a day in which 200 volunteers like him were to risk their lives in search of the impossible, a survivor. RAF helicopter crews shuttled ceaselessly along the coastline, their crews peering through the spray in the hope that so many hours after the disaster, someone still might be alive down there. The Union Star had been cast like a plastic toy on the rocks, a superstructure squashed beneath and no sign of life. Launched 10 days ago, she was on her maiden voyage bearing fertilizer from Holland to Runcorn. A new propeller shining starkly out of the water, along her side the clues to the last hours. With the master, his wife and the girls off, the Solomon Brown's last desperate attempt to rescue the other four. The lifeboat's paint and torn lines underlined their contact and the theory that as the bigger ship rolled, she fell smashing the lifeboat into smithereens. Along the coast, bits of wreckage, whilst this was the largest piece of her to be recovered. Oof. By now, the Sea King helicopters were braving all conditions just to rescue the dead, winching them back to the quayside of their village. Christmas in Mausol, now a time for unconsolable grief. Huddles of cousins, brothers, wives and sisters waited for nothing. For each of the eight dead lifeboatmen lived here, the coxswain was the landlord of the most important pub. Together, his crew leave 12 children under 10 without a father. Back at the Union Star, naval divers had been banging on the side of the ship in the hope of a response from an air pocket inside. As they prepared to blast a hole in the hull, it was still just possible that the men who had not been picked up could have survived. Braving a considerable sea, they leapt across the rocks to attach plastic explosives to two portholes that would gain them entry, either to find a survivor or to confirm another death. Two blasts were necessary, the ship's new metal refusing to yield easily. But their gamble was in vain, for very soon after, the ship's interior was ignited by a fragment of explosive and began to burn furiously. Exhausted, the divers sat above the wreck. Their unstinting effort to find someone still alive had failed. The tragedy had proved total. John Snow, ITN, Mauso. So that's that's the news that a lot of people woke up to that next morning. Other people had gone throughout the entire night trying to trying to rescue everybody everybody involved. It, uh, I mean, you heard you heard the outcome. Now let's take a little bit of a of a deep dive and. And get a, get a little more in depth into into what happened here. And as as always, we'll be watching this. And again, this is from the the good friends of the channel over at Retired Afloat. The link to the original video is down there in the description. Please, 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 if you have any interest in them whatsoever and other other uh, maritime disasters, they've got a, a great shackle. No, we had them on for the Shackleton expedition, I believe, not the Batavia. We had them on for the Shackleton expedition. Uh, so you check them out. They've got so many great explorer type videos there, and some of the some of the interesting disasters. Uh, subscribe to them, like them, and go leave them a comment. Let them know that uh, you're still thinking about them, and the legal vice has sent you again. Uh, all right. Now, I so said we have the bare bones of this, so let's let's take a deeper dive. Let's go a little bit deeper into this. With the uh, with our good friend Jeff Peters at uh, Retired Afloat. All right, that's better. All right, good day, everyone. Welcome along. Um, okay, so I have around about 25 or 26 speaking presentations in the stable in my repertoire, but I have to say that this one is by far the most difficult one for me to deliver. And for that reason, over the years, I've avoided delivering it at all. In fact, over six years, I've probably... Okay, I'm going to... 
that uh, the uh, uh, subtitles are impossible to to read there in that color. So let's turn them yellow, shall we? Oops, that was good. We'll in yellow them, and then we'll take this thing. We'll take off here. There should be a little easier to read once uh, once he takes the the other words off. All right, let's go back up just a quick second here. By far the most difficult one for me to deliver. And for that reason, over the years, I've avoided delivering it at all. In fact, over six years, I've probably only delivered this presentation five or six times. But as you'll hear, um, quite recently, sorry. See, I, the, and you know, it touches me that this, this case affects him this much as well. I mean, he hasn't even finished the introduction. He's forty. He's forty-eight seconds in, and he's already starting to choke up from this story. This is, I mean, as far as, far as heroic stories go, this is this is right up right up at the top. We made a promise to some very special people, and we fully intend to honor that promise. So we first heard about the, the Penley lifeboat disaster back in 2017 when we first went to Southampton in England to pick up our boat for the first time, which was going to become our home. And when I heard the story, I thought this would make a really good presentation. So I did some research into it and I built up a presentation and that um, presentation lasted about 20 minutes. So I combined it with a couple of other presentations, short stories about some of my other um, personal heroes, and I called that presentation Unknown Heroes. But whenever I went to present it, uh, I became emotionally involved in that presentation, and it was very, very difficult um, to present. Don't know why, had no idea why. It um, get, I get that way, but um, there's a couple of different theories about it. Um, my theory is that this is a tragic story, but I mean, there's lots of tragic stories out there. But um, this is something that's happened during our lifetime. In fact, only 41 years ago. And there's a couple of other complications or com um, things that add to that as well. For, for many, many years, right up until she passed away, my mum was a volunteer with the Australian Volunteer Coast Guard. She was a radio operator with, with the Coast Guard. And uh, Leanne and I are still currently serving officers with the Australian Volunteer Coast Guard. Lee's a qualified rescue boat crew person, and I'm a, a, uh, a rescue boat helmsman. Uh, we're both the commercially qualified radio operators. And at the moment, we hold the status of roving ambassadors for the Australian Volunteer Coast Guard, which is the good equivalent people. of the yeah, RNLI, good wife, or the some Royal seriously National good Lifeboat people. Institute Love them in to England. Death. And just to explain that these organisations are voluntary organisations. Uh, we have to raise our, our own funds and we don't have a Coast Guard in Australia or England. These are the organisations that uh, go out and uh, uh, help people when they're in, in, uh, in problems or uh, search and rescue operations. And I suppose the closest thing you have in the US is the US Coast Guard Auxiliary, uh, which was uh, uh, the Australian Volunteer Coast Guard is based upon. Um, but as I said, Lee, uh, that's one theory. Lee's theory, on the other hand, is I'm just a big sook and I should harden up. <laughs> so it's, it's great having that support from your wife. <laughs> Someone told me. But this is the story of the MV Union Star. It starts with the Union Star. And this is a typical coastal freighter, what's known as a coaster. And there's thousands and thousands of these all around the world. They're very standard. They're the Labradors of the, of the sea. Uh, you see, you've probably seen lots of these as you've cruised around around the world. They don't cross oceans like we're doing now, but they do all the coastal trade along um, continents, especially. And you can, you can see how small the ship is. It's uh, it's only about I think it was nine hundred and thirty five tons. That's that's very small as far as cargo ships go. Uh, it was about seventy meters long, so a little over seventy yards long. And as he, as he's going to mention, this is its maiden voyage. So often, I mean, th these ships, bad stuff happens on a, on maiden voyages. It's it's weird that anything anything happens, anything goes wrong on a ship's maiden voyage, but. It does. And a lot of times I've had a, several cases where 
they, they do what's called sea trials before they launch a new vessel, before they deliver the new vessel to the new owners, where basically they go out on the sea for a couple of days and they run all every possible test you can imagine on the ships. And I've, I've had several where there's been accidents that have happened, collisions and, and you know, scraping bottom on these brand new ships that haven't even been delivered to the buyer yet. It would be like you ordering a, you know, a supercar, a McLaren or, or something like that. And the, uh, the delivery guy gets in an accident on the way to give it to you. But this is a brand new ship, 935 tons, 70 meters in length. See throughout Europe, uh, Africa. And it just goes up and Asia. down the coast. carrying and the Union Star was Africa. built in Denmark. And it was on, it's at 70 meters by 11 meters. It has two engines which drive one propeller. It was on its maiden voyage. It was going to Rotterdam to pick up some fertilizer in Rotterdam. And it was taking that fertilizer to Ireland because that's exactly what they need in Ireland more fertilizer. <laughs> it had a crew of, of five men under the command of Captain Henry Morton. But Mr. Captain Morton made a secret unscheduled and unauthorized stop on the coast of England to pick up his wife and two teenage stepdaughters. Um, his stepdaughters lived in South Africa with their father. They wanted to spend Chris as much time uh, as possible. They only had a short amount of time in England over the school holidays and they wanted to maximize that time. So he made this unauthorized stop to pick them up so they could spend Christmas together because this was only happened a week before Christmas. Yeah, and I mean, we and we, we we heard it that I mean this was this was the week before Christmas, literally the week before Christmas, and there's so so many so many families now don't have brothers, sons, husbands, fathers to celebrate Christmas with, and every every Christmas, it's it's a reminder, and again you know, I. Not to not to totally off track thing, but as you know, I've told a, I've told the story a lot of times. Like my my older brother was killed in a, in an accident on New Year's Eve. So, yeah, New Year's Eve, it's just every New Year's Eve, it's there. And so every Christmas for for this entire village, you know, they they have this on their mind. So in total, there were eight souls on board the Union Star. But what didn't come out in the inquiry, what uh, we found, recently found out, is that Mrs. Morton herself was pregnant. Um, so really one more. Now their plan was to come through the Netherlands, through the English Channel and go what is referred to as around the, the corner of Land's End. And that's called the corner because it's uh, the most uh, southwestern part of England, go around there into the Irish Sea. And this will give you a little bit better idea of, uh, of Land's End over on the left-hand side. And this is this coastline of, uh, of Cornwall. And you see this little place here, this little village? You see that? You can see what? That's uh, any English people here? If you ever go to, uh, if you ever go to Cornwall and you ask for directions to Mouse Hole, I'll have no idea what you're talking about because it's called Mousel. Yeah, go figure. And uh, the, just to give you a, a bit of a scale here, the, the distance between Newland there and Mousel is around about six minutes drive, and one minute drive north of Mousel is Penley Point. The, so, the, um, so it's about five minutes, five or six minutes the, between uh, these two points. Where the Penley lifeboat base was um, uh, stationed. Now, Captain Morton rang his brother uh, during the early afternoon and said everything was going well and they expected to be around the corner into the Irish Sea either late afternoon or early evening. But at six o'clock that night, 1800, the Union Star made this call to the uh, Felmouth Coast Guard. Land's End Coast Guard, Land's End Coast Guard. Union Star, Union Star, calling Land's End Coast Guard. Union Star, Felmouth Coast Guard. So if, if you can't hear this and you're not in a position to read here, if you're on the road, you're driving or whatnot, you truckers and people are just using us for the commute. So your lands and coast guard, lands and coast guard, Union Star, Union Star calling lands and coast guard. Union Star, this is Falmouth Coast Guard over. Yes, we're approximately now eight miles east of Wolf Rock. Our engines have stopped and we are unable to get them started at the moment. Well, uh, approximately now eight miles east of Wolf Rock, uh, engines have stopped. 
and we are unable to get them started at the moment. So the engines have stopped. Um, they had called the uh, the Coast Guard on Channel 16, which is the international distress frequency. They hadn't issued a mayday, but uh, Channel 16 is uh, is monitored by all vessels at sea, including uh, the one that we're on right now. It's part of the safety of life at sea protocols, soulless protocols. And another vessel picked up this uh, this call, and that was the the, uh, the Nord Holland, which was a salvage tug. And the Nord Holland contacted the Union Star at 1816. See, now this is probably the best ship that could possibly hear that radio call because it's a salvage tug. They're super, super high horsepower engines. They're designed to pull ships. They're designed to push ships. They're, that's what they do. So we're off to a good start. Well, I mean, we're off to a bad start that on a maiden voyage, the engines go out in bad weather. And once your engines go out, you essentially have a dead ship on your hands. You're virtually completely at the mercy of the wind, the waves, the tides, the currents to uh, either take you out to sea, smash you on the rocks, just leave you where you're standing. You're that's that's what you're facing. That's what you're looking at. And so this is where he is. In, but luckily, they've they have a tug that is designed to haul salvaged objects that heard that overheard the radio call on the on channel 16, which as he said is the international channel that's. The, and that's what everybody monitors. And uh, Channel 16 is, is used for distress, but it's also used for initial calls. So they contacted yeah. each other on Channel 16, and then they went to a working... It's like, if, for the, all of you olds out there that remember CBs, uh, Channel 19 was the general channel on, on, on a, the, the CB radios, where everybody was a general broadcast channel. And if you found someone you were talking to, if you wanted to take, if you wanted to talk to someone, you didn't keep chattering on that channel. You said, let's go to channel 1840, channel two, whatever. You just picked a channel and you went there. That's essentially what they're doing here. You don't have lengthy discussions with other ships on channel 16. You'll agree to a new channel to go to. So that you can have a private line and you don't clutter up the airways for people that actually need to just to talk on that channel. Key frequency to have a conversation. And that was conversation was about the Nord Holland offering its tow, offering assistance to the Union Star under the Lloyd's open letter of salvage, which is a standard sort of um, salvage document, uh, which means that instead of having a fixed fee, uh, to tow someone from location A to a, a, a safe harbor of some sort, uh, whether that be three or four or 5,000 pounds, whatever it would be, depending on how far they would have to go. Under a Lloyd's letter of salvage, the amount of the, um, the compensation or the amount paid to the, the salvage tug is dependent upon a, it goes to a, an independent board in London and they assess the, uh, the, the compensation to be paid based on a number of, uh, of factors. Uh, so why is that? What, what, what does that mean? Why is that a good thing? Well, first of all, you, you do have a duty if there's a ship in danger, if, if, it is a, if it's a life-threatening situation, if a mayday has been called, you have a duty under law of just about any nation to... Stop what you're doing and go assist with the rescue efforts. But Mayday hadn't been called in this. He's just saying, hey, we got our engine out. Now, in either situation, whether it's under a Mayday situation, where it's an emergency life-threatening situation, or whether it's this kind of a situation, even though you go out of your way and you assist, you're required by law to assist, you still get compensated for that. You still get compensation. You can still claim for your, your, uh, your services. Now, in a situation like this, it's not where, you know, the ship isn't sunk or the ship isn't sitting waiting to waiting in a shipyard to be towed from point A to point B. It's in an active situation. You don't have time to appoint lawyers. You don't have time for the other ship to appoint lawyers and then have negotiations back and forth about exactly what sort of towage services you want. Uh, you know, when, what are the payment conditions? You know, when is it due and all, all this? You don't have time to negotiate a contract for helping someone out of a situation like this. So they have this open form, this Lloyd's open letter for salvage. Essentially what it is, is I need your help. 
I want to give you my help. Let's let's just do what we need to do. Then we'll submit it to what is essentially a panel of arbitrators who are going to look at it and go, okay, we think your fair costs for performing your salvage services are this much. And that's what you pay to the, uh, in this case, it would be, that's what you pay to the tugboat. So yeah, you, you don't, you don't get to sit back and go, oh my God, we're sinking, we're sinking, help us. He's like, well, what's it worth to you? That's not, <laughs> that's, that's not how that works. So that's what he's talking about here when he talks about the Lloyd's open letter. A matrix of factors. And those factors include things like the value of the ship, the value of the cargo, uh, the number of people on board, the likelihood of, of loss or damage of that ship and its cargo, Delays, the likelihood of, of uh, injury cost. or death to the people on board. And in this case, with a brand new ship making its maiden voyage, um, this amount could have amounted to tens or even of hundreds of thousands of pounds. Yep. And Captain Morton refused the offer of the tow. Um, he... I don't like to speak ill of the dead, but are you, you're kind of seeing a little bit here. He makes a secret unauthorized stop to pick up family members. That's one strike. Two strike. They've got a boat that has literally designed to provide the services that he needs. And because he's not sure how much it's going to cost and he doesn't want to be on the hook for all of this, which also kind of means he, he might not have had decent insurance. Because uh, if, you, if you're insured, it'll cover that. So I don't, I don't know exactly what the insurance conditions were, but strike two, he turns down help when it's offered. And see, this is, this is exactly what this panel of arbitrators are designed to prevent. You know, the, oh, help, help, we need help, we need help, we're drowning, we're sinking. All right, uh, we're, it, we'll, we'll do it if you agree to pay us $5 million. I don't have $5 million. Well, I guess you get to go to the bottom of the ocean then. Okay, 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 I promise I'll pay you $5 million. Just get us out of here. This is designed to prevent that usury, that, uh, you know, that, I don't know what, what a good word for it. Grift isn't the right word. Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like very, these are very usurious terms. You say, okay, look, I'll do this, you accept it, and then we'll let we'll let the professionals determine based on all these different factors what they believe these services are worth on a fair market. Extortion, yeah. Extortion's a decent word for it. Ransom, yeah. <laughs> uh price gouging, whatever you want to call it. That's what this panel of, of essential arbitrators are meant to do. They just review it. They go, okay, we're considering all these factors. We think the fair market value of this service was this much money. So for him, for him to go, and eh, no, might not have, well, in retrospect, it wasn't the right decision because when you, when you turn down the service, when you're drifting, when your engine is out, and you turn down the service of a, a tug that's specifically designed to tow you. What you've just done, and now mind you, it's him, his wife, and his two daughters. You've just put a dollar value. Exactly, Aaron, that's what I was just going to say. You have just put a dollar value on your family, on your own life and your family's life. That's essentially what you've done. The Coast Guard later called Captain Morton and asked him if he talked to the Un to the uh, the Nord Holland. And Morton replied dismissively, "Yes, I have. They're only interested in money." See, so you you've even got the, you've even got the Coast Guard going. Like, did, you talk to these guys, right? Like they're in disbelief that he's turned down these services. Like, yeah, you, you turned down the the salvage tug. They talked to you about this, right? And you returned them down, right? Like, yeah, they just want money. As as with so many of these Maritime Monday stories, money, 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 money causes problems. 
if if they had just accepted those tug services, we we would we would be talking about something else today. They would have got the boat hooked up. They would, the ship would have been hooked up. They would have towed it wherever they needed to go. The guy might have been in debt for the rest of his life if he didn't have decent insurance. Uh, but his family would be alive. He'd be alive. The crew would be alive. And the, the Penley lifeboat crew would be alive. Now, at this point, the, um, the, the weather wasn't too bad. Force five on the um, on the Baron, on the. Um, Beaufort. Beaufort scale, which you- yeah, they, they have the they, they have the the Beaufort scale, the Beaufort scale, whatever you want to call it. That's essentially it, it, it's it's a scale from one to ten that measures wave height and intensity. So it's basically wind, you know, from like calm seas or rolling seas to you, know, um, you know, massive waves and high winds. It's it's like an indication and and like a four or five. That's right in the middle. It's like it's a it's a bad storm, but it's not a horrific storm. It's not a hurricane. It's not a typhoon. It's nothing like that. It's high winds and waves. Um, I guess real quick we can we can tell you exactly what that is. Beaufort scale. I always call it Beaufort. It calls it the Beaufort. We also say voir dire or voir dire back home. Uh, Beaufort scale winds. All right, the Beaufort scale. Uh, he's saying it's a force five. A force five is a fresh breeze, 17 to 21 knots. That's about 19 to 24 miles an hour, 29 to 38 kilometers an hour. Uh, the winds are eight to 10.7 uh, meters per second. The waves are, are six to 10 feet, uh, which is what? Six to six to ten feet, two to three meters. Moderate waves taking a more pronounced long form. Many white horses, like the white caps, are formed. Chance of some spray. Small trees in leaf begin to sway. Crested wavelets form on inland waters. So you're just like right there. It's just just below like a strong breeze. The the storms get in like the you know high winds are at about a seven. A gale would be eight. Then a severe gale is a nine, and a storm, a whole gale. Oh, you know, they, they, it goes up to 12, sorry, not 10. And a hurricane is a 10, 11 is a violent storm, uh, and 10 is the, is the whole gale, as we said. So that's what the Beaufort scale is. It's just a wind scale. And so this is, here's a, just a fresh breeze. With, you know, trees are blowing and whatnot, six to 10 foot waves. Which is pretty mild sort of conditions, but the it's barometer just, was nothing. dropping very, very quickly. So the storms and intensifying. The, uh, the forecast was for a very severe storm that night. Now, the Penley lifeboat at Mousel was put on standby. At the time, the men were uh, adjusting the Christmas lights, the famous Mousel Harbour Christmas lights. And these have been operating for years and years and years. And this was a fundraising thing for the RNLI. The local council paid the RNLI to put up these lights and adjust them, uh, uh, replace any globes that might have uh, burnt out or anything like that. And so the men uh, were, were summoned together by their coxswain and they were placed on standby. They went and got their equipment and said goodbye uh, to their, their loved ones and assembled at the lifeboat station. So they knew that, oh God. They they knew that there was going to be bad weather. They knew the weather the weather was deteriorating. So here they're just the week before Christmas. They're put on alert. They get to leave their families and say, "All right, we got to go down to the station. We got to hang around the lifeboat and be ready just in case something happens." Now, as I said, the conditions were going to get very very bad. In fact, if you if you talk to uh, any of the old timers along that coastline, they all tell you this was the the worst storm in in living memory, and that's backed Oof. up by meteorological data. You um you go to the Met Office in England, and they'll tell you this was the very worst storm in the history since records had ever been kept. It went up to force twelve on the Beaufort scale. Now, the, the, as if we're talking about the force twelve, what you're looking at here is a picture of a of a breakwater and a lighthouse in a force 12 wind. That's a, yeah, that's, that's a force 12 storm. That's what this little 70 meter vessel, 900 ton vessel was facing. The one that had turned down being tugged, being towed by a professional specifically designed tugboat. So this is, this is what they were in store for this kind of weather here, which is the highest you can get. 
and it was hurricane conditions with swells of 60 feet, which are higher than, than the building we're in, the, the room we're in right now, uh, or 18 metres swells. Oof. At uh, 19.41, Morton reported to the Coast Guard that they'd found water, salt water in their fuel tanks, uh, and there was no possibility of starting these engines, and they requested assistance. The Coast Guard contacted the Royal Navy, and Rescue 80 was launched under the command of Lieutenant Commander Russell Smith of the United States Navy, who was on exchange to the Royal Navy at the time. And they, they went out to the location of the, the Union Star. By this time, obviously, it's it's pitch black. See, I mean, you, you can hear Jeff. Jeff is already, I mean, he's already tearing up, just mentioning the names of these real-life people. And if, if this captain had just taken that tug when it was offered. But no, you know, he, he's thinking he's better than that. And then once everything goes to shit... Once, once you know you're doomed, then 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 you ask other people to come out and save your ass. There was no reason for anyone to die that day. None. But what, once the weather starts getting terrible, once they're finding salt water in the fuel, once once they realize that they're they're beyond help, then they want the help. Do you see the irony there? Once they're beyond help, they want the help. They didn't want it when it was nice and calm and everything would have been easy. Now they want it. And that's when they're asking other people, eight other people. They They decided to risk their life for money. And once they realize that, oh, my God, we may have bitten off more than we can chew, they ask eight fathers, brothers, husbands, sons to risk their lives to save these people that made bad, bad choices. They they went out to the Union Star. They made contact with them. Commander Smith said that the Nord Holland was still standing by. And uh, Commander Smith advised them that they were getting closer and closer to the coast. What do you want us to do? And Captain Morton uh, said they're still trying to start these engines. They've, they've got an idea. They might be able to start them. God, listen to this. That tugboat knew things were going to go to shit. So they're waiting. They're sitting there going, all right, when you're ready. Now we're in these winds. They've asked, the, they've asked for a rescue from the Coast Guard. They've asked for this help. The tugboat is still there. And the tugboat is saying, do you want us now? Are you ready? And they're saying, no, 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 no. We want to try a few more things. They want to try a few more things before they commit to paying money. Even in, these, in this situation, the captain is still putting that dollar value on his life and the lives of his family. And now he's pulled in other people as well. Now, and I got to be critical here because now he's saying that these, that these, the Coast Guard people, later the RNLI people that are involved, he's saying their life, their lives are not worth whatever it would take to tow that ship. He's saying his family, you know, his family is, is, is not worth it. These people are not worth it. That's essentially what he's saying by, all right, I'm not going to pay to be towed out of here, but, uh, you know, I want you to come and do this shit for free. Um, the, he heard, C Commander Smith heard the Nord Holland radio the Union Star saying, this is your last chance. Do you want to tow or not? Because we're not staying out here any longer. And once again, Captain Smith refused the tow. And there's been speculation over the years about why he would do that. Um, now, most certainly, if this had gone to a Lloyd's letter of salvage, they'd be gone to an independent board. They would have found out that his wife and daughters were on this vessel uh, who, who weren't authorized. Oh, there you go. Vessel. There you go. I forgot about that. Yeah. That may have that may have been a breach of his insurance terms. Uh, by friends, it could have it could have been a couple hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it, it could have been anywhere from you know tens of thousands of pounds to you know a hundred, couple hundred thousand pounds. But I yeah I did I didn't even think about that. His 
family that were unauthorized and not supposed to be on that ship that he got on a on a secret and and uh, un, unauthorized stopover may have invalidated his insurance terms. And that could have meant, probably would have meant the end of Captain Morton's career. But we just don't know what was going through his mind at the time. And the, and the Nord Holland departed from the scene. Um, Commander Smith kept on radioing, saying, you're getting closer and closer. By this time, they were only two and a half miles off the coast. They drifted in from eight miles to two and a half miles. So Commander Smith was asking for instructions. What do you want us to do? And eventually, this conversation took place. How many people do you plan on transferring? Uh, one woman and two children, are there? Sorry, say again. One woman and two children, are there? Sorry, say again. <laughs> See, I don't know if he actually had problems hearing this, but when you're talking about a coastal cargo ship, you know, one of these coastal ships, and they ask you how many people you need, you know, who you need rescued from your ship, they're not expecting this to be hearing a woman and two children. Yeah, exactly, KT. That's not the answer they were expecting. And I'm sure the first, can you say that again, was, now what? I, and then he says it, and then he asks for a third clarification. The radio communication is clear. They're hearing it, but they're not hearing it, I think. Uh, well, let's see. <laughs> the, the dogs are in full-on snore fest here. Sorry if you, if you hear some, some snoring going on. One woman and uh, two children. The crew will remain aboard until, uh, until the last of it. Yeah, so one woman and two children. Yes, that's correct. And the the crew will remain on board. The crew will stay here, but get my wife and kids off. Now, this is the very first time that anyone knew that there was women and children aboard this ship. They, uh, Morden had told the Coast Guard that there was eight people on board, and that's what Rescue 80 uh, had heard as, as well. Um, but they, no one had known that there were women and children on board the vessel. Now, if you read the standard operating procedures or the manuals for any rescue organisation or any first responders, it will tell you that all lives are created equal. But the truth is, in reality, and I can tell you from experience, that when women and children are involved, the rescuer takes on an extra burden of responsibility. And that's what happened on this evening. Now, they try... I mean, especially women and children who, who did nothing wrong, nothing at all, who were just there with... You know, they weren't crew. They weren't, they weren't you know, sailors. They were there to spend a little more time with dad and 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 husband. You know. Tried to winch a man down, and can you imagine the, the conditions? I don't know if any of you have been in a helicopter before, or especially a military helicopter, but they're not the most stable things in the world at the best of times. And this wasn't the best of times. They were flying in a hurricane. Commander Smith had to point the, the Sea King helicopter into this wind. He had to rev the engines up a lot so he'd be able to hold his position into this huge hurricane winds. The water was lashing, the rain was lashing against the windscreen. The wipers were going full tilt, but he could hardly see anything out that windscreen. And you also had the salt spray from that wind hitting that windscreen as well. He had um, observation uh, windows below him, and he could see out from there, but the, the sea spray was uh, clogging up those windows as well. So he was virtually blind. It was up to one of his men to lean out, the, of the crew member of the helicopter, to lean his head and his upper body out the side of the helicopter in these hurricane in a hurricane, yeah. to warn to be able to warn uh, Commander Smith what was happening and to guide him uh, during the, the the, the next uh, uh, several minutes. Now, 
Commander Smith has told us that a Sea King helicopter, when it's in a hover position, it's nose up and tail down, rotor tail down. That's just the, the natural state of it. And that made it even more unstable during this, this hurricane, these hurricane conditions. They had to try and lower a man down uh, by a, uh, on a wire down to the deck of the, the Union Star. Now, they've shone a spotlight down onto the, the deck of the Union Star. The Union Star was actually able to get their generator going for, for a while, and they had their deck lights on. So the ship was quite visible uh, during this time. But you can imagine that everything else around the ship was absolutely inky black. You couldn't see a thing. So when those 60-foot swells came across and lifted this ship up, suddenly lifted this ship up towards the hovering helicopter. Commander Smith on several occasions had to yank back on the yoke of and lift up as quickly as possible as his man who was leaning out the side of the helicopter screamed, uh, climb, climb, climb. And on several occasions, the rotor blade... <sighs> and again, he's going to talk about this here, but these huge swells... The helicopter is actually lower than the waves while they're trying to lower someone down to rescue the, 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 the woman and the children. Like, literally, the waves are higher than the helicopter's position. <sighs> Screamed, uh, climb, climb, climb. And on several occasions, the rotor blades of the helicopter, the, the tail rotors of the helicopter almost hit the superstructure of the ship. It was extremely dangerous. Mm -hmm. And then you had that man that was hanging down on that wire. Mm -hmm. He was swinging wildly in these huge winds. Um, mm -hmm. He almost hit the superstructure on several occasions. Oh. On one occasion, as the, the ship rose, he almost smashed into the side of the ship. It was only because Commander Smith was able to pull up quickly that he missed the uh, smashing into that ship. And on another occasion, he watched as the ship rose up towards him. He was convinced that, that this is it. Um, but once again, Commander Smith was able to, to climb quickly. But um, he, um, his enduring memory of that night is that he got so close to the wheelhouse on one occasion, he could look across and he could see the lower legs of two people. And one of those, those people was obviously a young woman wearing bright red shoes. And... Um, and that memory has lived with him ever since. Now, Commander Smith had to abort the operation. There was absolutely no choice. Um, they couldn't do any more. And the Penley lifeboat was activated. It was... Can you imagine that, being in, being in the helicopter? I mean, anybody in that helicopter. You, you have to keep... You have to keep the helicopter lower than the crest of some of these waves. You have to keep quickly quickly going up so that your guy doesn't get taken out by the waves or, or worse you your entire helicopter gets taken out by the waves and you're so close to rescuing these people you're so close to rescuing these people that you can see what color shoes they're wearing that's how close you are to these people you can see what color shoes the little girl is wearing but you can't save them you have to give up and turn it over to people on the water that's when they they activate the the lifeboat crews here now the uh and i i hate to bring these stories where everything keeps getting worse but this 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 is this is one of those this is one of those everything gets worse stories um, the, uh, the Penley lifeboat crew, the, uh, the, the skipper was a man named, uh, Trevelyan Richards and the second coxswain, a mechanic was a man named James Madron. The assistant mechanic was Nigel Brockman. The emergency mechanic was John Blewett. The, the crew members were Charles Greenhaw, Kevin Smith, Barry Torrey, and Gary Wallace. Uh, the skipper, I mean, he was he was a very, very highly experienced, very skilled man, very respected seaman who we were talking about. He owned he owned the, the local pub, the most important pub in town, as they said earlier. And knowing the weather conditions, they were expecting the hurricane winds 
when they were put when they're told to be on standby that he chose the very best crew to take out to sea with him the ones that could handle those conditions the the best of the best from the volunteers it's under the command of a man by the name of Trevelyan Richards who was the coxswain he was already a legend amongst the um, the RNLI and his local community for the uh, some of the rescues he'd been involved in in the past, an absolute legend. He uh, collected 12 crew members, um, nine men who had volunteered uh, to go out on the lifeboat and three men who were going to be the launching party of the vessel. Now remember, these are all unpaid volunteers uh, who just want to serve their community. Most of them were fishermen or retired fishermen. Two of the volunteers were a father and son, Nigel and Neil Brockman. But um, Richard said that he wouldn't take two members of the same family out on a night like this. And young Neil Brockman at the age of 18 was forced to stay behind. Let, let that sink in. This guy who had at least three opportunities to hook up to a tug and get towed away perfectly safely. But just, just because of a little bit of money, well, maybe a lot of money, just because of money, he rejected those offers. He puts the Coast Guard's lives at risk while they're trying to rescue by helicopter. And imagine being being the helicopter crew, knowing that you can't get to them, even though you're so close, you can see the color of the little girl's shoes and you can't do a thing about it. And as, as Sonia Chris, who's, who's the first super chat of the evening, thank you so much for that. As, as an army flight paramedic who has done rescue hoist work, this is what we do and you're hanging by a wire rope that is about the size of your little finger, and then having to say, no, we can't do it, is the absolute worst. I mean, imagine how they feel going, all right, this guy's decisions, we can't help anymore. And they have to cut off and turn it over to the, the lifeboat crew. Thank you so much for the, thank you so much for that very generous super chat, Chris. Uh, it's, you, blessings to you. Appreciate that. And then to turn it over to the, 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 the local lifeboat crew. And the conditions are so bad that the skipper, he knows how bad it is. He knows how serious this risk is. He knows what this weather can do to the point that he is so convinced that they might not come back from this, that he refuses to take two people from the same family. The only reason you do something like that is you specifically don't want two people from the same family to die that day. So, I mean, that's, that's very telling when specifically because of the weather and what they're going to face, he refuses to take two people from the same family. But yet, this guy, he's, you know, he, he, he's, it's too late now. He's fucked. And now he, now he wants everyone else to put their lives at risk to correct his bad decision. And the lifeboat was launched at 2012, 12 minutes past eight that night. Now, to launch the lifeboat, this is where the lifeboat is held, uh, housed at Penley Point. To launch that lifeboat, it's got to slide down that yeah. ramp into the water. This was obviously taken in nice conditions, but as I said before, this was an inky black night, huge storm, uh, hurricane conditions with swells and waves hitting those, those, those rocks behind there. The, the, the launching crew had to wait several agonizing minutes to launch because so that, until they could find a window where they could launch because if they launched at the wrong time, the life that would just be picked up and uh, put back, smashed back on the rocks so you can see behind the launching station there. But eventually it was launched. And the lifeboat's name was the Solomon Brown, 14 metres long or 47 feet long. Um, it is just a wooden boat. 
had a top speed of nine knots or 17 kilometers an hour. And it got out to the Union Star half an hour after it was launched. And by this time, the Union Star were only a mile off the coastline. They deployed their anchor, trying to stop them from, from drifting any further, but that anchor was just dragging. It wasn't stopping them at all. Uh, and by this time, they were coming into shallower waters. So instead of these huge swells, they were now getting severe breaking storms, waves breaking over the top of the ship. Now, uh, Commander um, Smith and the crew of Rescue 80 had stood by. They weren't going anywhere. They wanted to provide assistance by providing light um, to the lifeboat. So they stayed above, giving advice and information to the lifeboat crew. At one time, Commander Smith radioed that you're only 300 miles from the coast. Meters. And he reported that... That should be 300 meters from the coast. It's like literally that's how close they were to shore. They were 300 meters from the coast, 300 yards, a little, little more than 300 yards, about 400 yards, somewhere around there. So, uh, that's so close. The 300 yards from, sorry, yards from the coast. And um, he, um, he said that he could see that the, the men of the Solomon Brown lined up on the, on the deck as they, time and time again, they went over to the, the side of the Union Star and the, the vessel was smashed up against the Union Star. He said he could see the men lined up along the deck trying to hold on to the railings, trying to put ropes through the railings to hold themselves against the deck. And they were calling out to the people in the, in the wheelhouse to come out, come out to the boat. But none of them did. And I mean, I just couldn't imagine what it would have been like with, within that wheelhouse. Um, I mean, you've, it would be, everyone would have been terrified, of course, but Mrs. Morton and the daughters probably would have been severely seasick as well. So there's probably excuses, reasons why they weren't able to, to run out to the lifeboat of that time. But they kept on going back time and time again. See, and this is the thing. You, they're there. They're saying, come out, come out. But for whatever reason, you, you, they can't. You, you'll get the lifeboat. I don't, I don't have, I guess we can do this here. You've got, you know, you've got your big ship and you've got the lifeboat with the waves and the swells, you'll, you'll have the lifeboat coming close and then you'll have, a, you know, it'll go away again. You, you have just a few seconds to get someone and it's an incredibly, incredibly dangerous operation anyway. But you know, when, when everything is moving like this, the time where you're together and you can get people into the lifeboat is extraordinarily limited. So they keep failing. They keep having to come back again, right up against the ship. And again, they, they can't do it. And then again, up against the ship. Uh, and this, this just continues and nobody can get off this ship. Trying to hold on to the side of the lifeboat. On one occasion, a, a huge wave picked up the Solomon Brown and deposited it on the foredeck of the, um, of the Union Star. Listen to that. A wave tossed this 14 meter ship onto the deck of the Union Star, literally lifted it up and placed it on top of the other ship. Like that. Fuck me. And when that ship rolled, they stayed there for a few seconds and when the ship rolled again, it slid back into the water. Ah. And it's believed that at this time, the propeller of the Solomon Brown was badly damaged because when it was recovered, one of the blades of the propeller was severely bent, which would have made it very, very difficult to uh, steer the vessel and operate, propel the vessel, which makes what happened afterwards even more remarkable. You spoke too soon, Daily Quick Bites. The Solomon Brown suffered propeller damage, which arguably is, is worse than hull damage. I mean, it slows you down. It makes navigation a bitch. It, 
it's it's choppy. It, it it causes ridiculous amounts of vibrations. And as he's saying, you just knowing that they have a that they have a damaged propeller makes this what happens next. I mean, just even more unfathomable. Because they kept on going back. Smith reported to them that they're only 10 minutes from the beach. Oh. And, and they're, now they're operating. They were trying to get through the, 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 the chain from the, um, from the anchor was getting in the way. They tried to maneuver the way through there. They had to maneuver the way through rocks along the, the coastline there, try and get along the side of the vessel. But they kept on going back. And on one occasion, looking through the spotlight, uh, Commander Smith said that he saw... Uh, four or five people running out of the the, um, the, un the wheelhouse of the Union Star and jumped down to the Solomon Brown. Now, by this time in the helicopter, they had had proximity alarms, collision alarms going off because they'd been so close to the Union Star. Now, those alarms were going off again because they were now so close to the cliffs behind them. They were trying to shine their lights on and were, the, the tail rotors were getting too close to the Okay, there's, there's a couple things going on here. One, if you heard four people from the uh, the other vessel jumped onto the lifeboat during one of their close approaches, they managed to jump onto the lifeboat. So now there's there's four people on the other ship, and there's now there's twelve people on the lifeboat the crew of eight and then the four people that jumped over. And plus as he's saying when, when ships get close, everything is, there's radar, uh, you know, proximity detectors collision. And it's amazing. The, I mean, the technology wasn't super sophisticated back in the eighties, but they had the proximity alarms. And so you get, you get too close, you know, within, within uh, you know, a quarter of a mile or so, or, you know, a few hundred yards, then alarms start going off then you're too close to this. So, th I mean, it's just constantly going on because these two ships are right next to each other. And then they're only 300 yards from the shore. So then you, the, you're going to ground. You're going up against the rocks. Those alarms start going on top of this madness and this mayhem with the helicopter lights, the lifeboat coming. So it's, I mean, the, the, the sound and the confusion and the urgency must have just, just been unfathomable the cliffs but there was other problems as well because that salt spray that, that from this hurricane uh, was getting into the fuel in, in the air intake valves of the engines and the engines were showing that they were overheating so commander smith had to say we've got to leave we've uh -huh. got to go back to base and uh, he and uh, rescue 80 headed back to their base and about 30 seconds after they left commander smith heard a radio call saying we've got four off We've got four off. And they went on to, and Commander Smith remembers just looking across at his co pilot and shaking their heads in wonder about how they had done that. There's a radio call a few seconds later saying, We've got four off. We're going back for the other two. Now, everyone knew there was eight people on board. They've got four off. They're going back for the other two. That's only six. Um, so there was a bit of confusion. So the Coast Guard radioed up. Penley lifeboat, Penley lifeboat to try and get clarification, but they didn't get a response and they never would. Mm. The next morning, the, um, the wreckage of the, the Union Star was found washed up on the rocks along that Cornish coastline. Uh, the almost brand new propeller was, was shining in the weak uh, English sunlight. The largest part of the Solomon Brown that was found wasn't much bigger than this podium. And all 16 people on board uh, the, the two vessels uh, perished that night. Now, over the next few days, uh, what happened? Commander Smith got back to their base. They immediately hosed out their air intake valves. They took on more fuel and they went back and they searched all through the night uh, for survivors to no avail. But... Um, over the next few days, only eight bodies of the 16 were found, four from the Solomon Brown, four from the Union Star. And on Christmas Eve, um, the heartbroken village of Mausel buried two of their heroes and they buried the other two on Boxing Day. 
at the inquiry, Commander Smith said that the actions by the, the lifeboat and their crew that he had seen were the greatest acts of courage that I've ever seen and I'm ever likely to see. Now, some good did come out of this. Uh, there was an inquiry into what had happened and there was actions taken, Rule, laws were changed. And this, these laws are called the legacy of the Solomon Brown. Um, the Coast Guard is no longer passive. They can issue a mayday on behalf of a vessel and they can also order the captain to take on a tow or to abandon ship. And it's said that the legacy of the Solomon Brown has saved hundreds of lives over the last 40 years. And that is such a huge thing. Because back then, you, you, you couldn't force someone to be smart. You couldn't force someone to make a good decision. You know, he doesn't want the tug. He doesn't want, you know, he doesn't want to be towed somewhere. Not your problem. But now, because of this, the Coast Guard can say, no, no, it, we're calling in the Mayday. The Coast Guard can say, you got two choices, pal. Get off the ship yourself, abandon ship, or you're going to take the tow. Which essentially would bind them into, into whatever it's going to cost to save their asses. And here in chat, we, we have Maverick Buckley. Maverick Buckley says, I'm writing a play about this. I'm related to Gary Wallace. What a crazy coincidence. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, Gary Wallace is one of the crew members of the, of the lifeboat. So it's a pleasure having you here, Maverick. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, please, I would be, I would, I would love to, I would love to see the play when you're finished writing it. Feel free to email me anytime. I would, I would, I would love to, love to read the play. Young Neil um, Neil Brookman Brockman, um, he stayed in the RNLI. Ten years later, he was made the youngest coxswain in the history of the RNLI, and he uh, he served in that capacity for sixteen years, spending a total of thirty years as a volunteer in that organisation. Uh, and that's him there. Lee and I had the honour uh, last December to go to Penley and present on behalf of, we were tasked by the Australian Volunteer Coast Guard to present a flag um, as a mark of our respect for what these men and the men that have gone before them uh, do on a daily basis. And we were very, very proud to do this. We have to say there was the whole crew were there and there was also family of the, the men who had lost their lives that night. Um, we were a little bit nervous about going along. Um, there was a little bit of trepidation because these people knew that I did a presentation about their loved one, about the, the Solomon Brown, and we didn't know how they'd react to that. So we were very happy and very relieved when um, during the ceremony, uh, Patch Harvey, who's the current coxswain, and he's been the coxswain for 16 years, and he's already done, also done 30 years service. He turned around and he was said he they were very, very grateful uh, that the word of what had happened back in 1981 was still being told and that uh, they asked us to keep um, on giving these speaking presentations. And uh, uh, then he turned around and he did something that surprised us uh, very much. Um, he gave us these, he presented Lee and I with these T-shirts, uh, which are cre crew T-shirts, and they inducted us as honorary members of the Penley Lifeboat. Sorry. But some of the families were there as well, and um, we, we didn't know how they would feel about things. But once again, um, they were very, very grateful. And, and their concern that as they pass on, the story of the heroism of their loved ones will be lost as well. So they made us promise. Uh, but no matter how, how hard this was, we will continue to tell the story. And as I said, that's a promise we intend to honour. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, we also caught up with Neil Brockman. Um, lovely, lovely guy. Great sense of humour. 
Um, he's got a very rich Cornish uh, accent. He probably should come with no. subtitles. Uh, so he <laughs> should have come with subtitles. <laughs> no, the, he, he was he was not the uh, he was not the chopper pilot. He's he's just a uh, he's a sailor that he spends he and his wife spend six months of the year sailing around. They spend the other six months giving lectures like this on uh, on on the uh, on cruise ships. So yeah, he's he's not the he's not the chopper pilot. You can understand him a bit better, but he's a lovely, lovely guy. He is also extremely proud of his father and his ex-crewmates as, as well. He told us a lot of stories about what had happened and previous rescues and things. And um, he's very. there were some things that didn't come out um, at the inquiry that he was able to tell us about, including he's talked about his father. And he said that his father, and you can probably see from this photo, his father was one of those people that would walk into a room and light it up all immediately. He was one of those great humorous people that always had a laugh, a smile on his face and made people laugh. But he said that he was proud of his father because when his father's body was found, his arms were wrapped around the youngest girl, uh, trying to protect her to the very edge. I, as I said before, I avoided giving this presentation for a long, long time. And um, it's a small world. And um, back in early 2019, we were on a cruise on the Viking Sun. And I did, for some reason, I don't know why, there was actually no reason why I would do it, but I decided to give this presentation. See, he told this story when, when he was on, on the channel here with me when we, when we interviewed him. This is just, this is so wild. This story is, this, this is a wild story here. It's a small world. And um, back in early 2019, we were on a cruise on the Viking Sun. And I did, for some reason, I don't know why, there was actually no reason why I would do it, but I decided to give this presentation. And afterwards, a man came down to the front of the stage here, and he was very emotional. And he introduced himself as Richard Smith, the older brother of the helicopter pilot, Russell Smith. You wouldn't uh. read about it. Um, he got a, a copy of, of the video from the wonderful production staff with, with Viking. He sent that to his brother, Russell, who, who contacted uh, uh, myself. And Russell was able to give us a lot of information about what, was, uh, what happened that night. We plan to catch up with Russell um, and Richard in their hometown of Eugene, Oregon in April 2020, but obviously COVID hit and we couldn't go. Uh. But just before um, we arrived on the ship in LA back in early January this year, um, Viking uh, very generously flew Leanne and I to San Francisco. And uh, we spent four days there with the family, with Richard and Russell and their, their wives. And uh, it was just a, a wonderful time. And I just want a big shout out, thank you to the two ladies who organized the Viking Enrichment Program, Alison and Kelly, uh, for enabling this to happen. It was just a, a wonderful thing for them to do. And we, we had a lot of laughs and, and a lot of tears um, during that four days. There was a couple of nights where we stayed up to the wee small hours of the morning talking about things. Um, I've read through the, the report of the inquiry several times, and they go out of their way to praise uh, Commander Smith and Rescue 80 for their valour and for their skill and for their resolve that night. It goes to say that the report says that they went way beyond what any reasonable person would have expected them to do that night and that there was, given the conditions, there was nothing more that they could have done. And Russell knows that in his head. But he was saying that he has often, I mean, over the last 40 years, he often thinks, was there something else I could have done or could have said that uh. might have changed things at all? Um, he has been to um, the town of the village of Mausel on a couple of occasions. He's met the family. He's met the, the lifeboat crew there. And he said that he always felt very welcome there, but not always very comfortable. Um, because of what had happened. But we were able to tell him that we've spoken to the families and they hold him in the highest regard. They have so much respect for him. Uh, they told us they feel a special bond with him because he was the last man to see, the last person to see their men alive. And he was the person that was able to explain to them what happened 
on that night. So they're very, very grateful to him. And during the course of this four days, um, uh, Russell told us that, and um, his, his wife and brother and, and sister-in-law also confirmed that he hadn't talked about this, uh, this event. He talked more about this event in that four days than he had in the previous 40, day, 40 years. And the family now had a much better understanding of what he had been going through. And he felt that it was a cathartic experience for him as well which was was great uh, and like i said they're wonderful people we hope to catch up with them again later this year but we also uh, expect that we'll be lifelong uh, long friends now the, the famous mausel christmas uh, harbor lights at uh, on the 19th of uh, december every year the lights are turned off between the hours of 8 p.m and 10 p.m as a tribute, ongoing tribute to the men of the Solomon Brown. And I'd like to play you a video now. And this video was, was um, made by the families of the 16 people who lost their lives that night. Uh, the families of from both, of both vessels, the Solomon Brown and the Union Star have come together and they all support each other without any recriminations or anything like that, which is absolutely wonderful. Yeah, that's and amazing. At the end of this video, you'll see, um, an area that is a memorial area that's been uh, uh, made on the headland overlooking the cove where the, um, the disaster culminated on that night. And um, about halfway through the video, you'll hear a radio call from the Falmouth, Falmouth Coast Guard to the Penley lifeboat. Now, you probably be able to hear the despair and the resignation in the voice of the radio operator Ugh. as he makes these calls. But he stayed at his post all night. He refused to be relieved by his colleagues. And he made this call more than 200 times. And after each call, he paused, waiting, hoping in vain that he would receive a response. So to me, he's another unknown hero. And after the video plays, I'm gonna put up a, a, a quote from Winston Churchill, which describes the spirit of a lifeboat and the men and women who man these lifeboats. I won't be able to read it out. So I'm just hoping, I'm just asking that you would read it to yourselves. Just, just the amount of absolute heroism that went into this night, everybody. And I, I don't, I don't know if this is going to. I have to watch the. I have to watch my own stream here because I don't know if this is going to get copyrighted or not. If it does, we'll fast forward through it. But I hope it doesn't. Lands in Coast Guard. Lands in Coast Guard. Union Star. Union Star. Lands in Coast Guard. Union Star. Union Star. Lands in Coast Guard. Union Star. Union Star. Lands in Coast Guard. Engines failed, and not too far from deadly rocks, drifts Union Star. Captain Morton, his family and crew, prayed for help as the storm winds blew. Please, St. Brendan, Lord of hosts, watch over those who work our coast. Protect them from the raging seas. And give them love and life and peace. But Sea King tried to weather the gale and lift them off to no avail. From Penley Point came Solomon Brown, eight men aboard, no backing down. Please, St. Brendan, watch our coast. Protect the ones we love the most. Shield them from the raging seas and give them love and life and peace. Pitched and tossed in mighty waves, great rocks and witches tried to save the stricken crew at any cost. But every mortal soul was lost. Uh. 
repeated that message more than 200 times just trying to get a hold of the lifeboat. Christmas week for 16 souls, the families weep. For Solomon Brown and the company, and all those lost upon the sea. Each Christmas now, for those who died, the lights of Mousel dim with pride. For lifeboat crews who heed the call, who put to sea and give their all. Please, St. Brendan. Watch over those who work our posts, protect them from the raging seas, and give them love and life and peace. Please, St. Brendan, watch our coasts, protect the ones we love the most, shield them from the raging seas, and give them love and life and peace. At Winston Churchill, what it says here is, uh, what is a lifeboat? It drives on with a mercy that does not quail in the presence of death. It drives on as a proof, a symbol, a testimony that valor and virtue have not perished in the British race. So Winston Churchill. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. That's that's the, that's the video of the presentation that was done by Jeff Peters uh, earlier last year. Uh, and they're again, they're great friends of the channel, uh, Jeff and his wife. The link to the original video is down below. Please go over there and like it and leave a leave a leave a good message from. Tell them, tell them your friends at Legal Vices sent you and subscribe to the channel if you like the videos that he's done. They, he uploads every couple of months, he'll upload a new presentation, updated versions of things. <clears throat> and the Livid Pigeon says, please donate to the RNLI. It is solely charity based. That's, that's absolutely true. And if you recall, we had, uh, we had the people from Nomadic Watches in, in Ireland on here a while ago, uh, Patrick, the, the founder of Nomadic Watches. And uh, he mentioned that every November, 10% uh, of ten percent of their sales proceeds goes to the RNLI. Um, I've I've bought a watch from them the last two years this year and, and, and well, I guess you know, 2022 and 2023 in November just to help support the, uh, the lifeboat crews. Um, they are completely, the government does not give any donations to support. It is purely, purely outside funded. Um, you can go to rnli.org and look at things there. You can, you can uh, do other searches to find ways that you can, you can help assist with that. But I, again, we, we 16 lives were lost that day. Many more, including the helicopter crew were put in danger. Just, just because of some bad decisions involving dollar signs. <sighs> but what, I mean, it's, 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 it's tragic, but like I said, this, the, the, the heroism of literally everybody involved in this story is, I know it sounds hyperbolic to say they're off the charts, but they're they're off the charts in this case. I mean, just it's absolutely stunning. And uh, we we have a little bit of extra time, so 
what I wanted to do was first of all uh, mention that the family, the, the people and, and family that that died were from the RNLI was William Richards, James Madron, Nigel Brockman, John Blewett, Charles Greenhaw, Kevin Smith, Barry Torrey, and Gary Wallace. And from the Union Star side of things, Captain Henry Morton, mate James Whitaker, engineer George Sedwick, uh, crewman Angostino Verissimo, Veris Verissimo, I guess, and uh, Manuel Lopez, and Captain Morton's wife, Dawn, and two stepdaughters, Sharon and Deanne. Now, with the with the little with the little bit of time we have, um, I just wanted to show a couple of a couple of the actual RNLI rescue videos, so you, you can kind of you can kind of see this in action. Uh, let's see here. Let me bring this up. We've shown this video before. That's that's the lifeboat. It's going out to rescue. Those are all volunteer people that go out to do this. It's 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 insane. There you go. There's a there's an onboard view. Let's let's embiggen this here. And you, you've got to go out and rescue people in these conditions. Now, this this is sort of kind of the same scenario that we had with the uh, with the other vessel, the the Union Star. The engine's not working, and this this is the most dangerous position that a ship can be in when you're parallel with the waves, because it'll just roll you straight over. And you can see this big monster wave that's coming for this ship that's alongside, and they've got to they've got to try to rescue this ship before it goes under with the crew. Oof. Uh, Nathan C. Wait, Australia doesn't have a real Coast Guard to send out rescue boats. They only have this RNLI, which they don't fund. Now that's the that's the entire uh, you know, UK. It's 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 that way all all along the you know the English coast, the the Scottish coast, Northern Ireland, you know, Ireland. It's just that's just kind of the way it is all around that area. The Coast Guard to do the air rescue. And things like that. You know, they do the military things, but the civilian rescues this is what you got. Look at that wave. God. This is from the other side, I guess. Once they get it towed off. Look at the tow lines. They're under and those are as, as those are not thick. I mean they're relatively thick, but just all of that water weight and the tension being created, you snap one of those and somebody's going to die. But I mean, just look how far under the water these tow lines are. Ugh. You've got some surfers up against the rocks, some surfers or swimmers or something. Oh, see, these are, these are 
this is the new the new boat that some of you were talking about in chat where it's it's essentially I won't say unsinkable but it'll it rewrites itself. <laughs> it's a pretty damn cool ship. Um, let's see bring up a Joe Choi says that is Wales. That's the great Orme back there. Rough. I when I was I was up in Seoul over the weekend to rescue my credit card and I spent spent about six hours drinking with an amazing Welshman. Had a great conversation with him. Here's some rescue highlights from 2022. This little eleven year old boy was like a mile out to sea. You okay. A little guy. That's in there. Uh, there, 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 there. Down up the street. Three meters, man. I'm going to get... You ready? Yeah. Look at that rain and wind. Huh? Okay. Well done, mate. Surfer. Stay there, yeah. We'll come. To, we're going to come to you. Stay where you are, yeah. Stop. Stop. Put your hand in the air. The other one. Other hand, mate. Grab my wrist. Come on, baby. Come on. Aw, little doggo. Aw. Hey, there are you. Yeah. Yeah. This is not a get the person. Okay, contact. Hold on for this. Jump on, we'll get the board. Okay. Step straight onto that. Oh, live. Busy. Right, yeah. Thank you so much. Got you. You on? And we'll just we'll just show one more, and then we'll kind of wrap it up a little little bit early. But I just wanted you to see them actually doing doing the rescue operations because now all the rescue operations are are filmed. It's just was that just was something that wasn't done in 1981. But now all the all the rescues are are on on video and things. There's a lot of them here on YouTube. Um, someone was mentioning, oh yeah, the, uh, the the BBC Two show Saving Lives at Sea. There's a lot of those videos here. I tried to show one once and got instantly copyright claimed by the BBC. <laughs> KT asked, do they have something similar to the RNLI or, or USCG in Korea? Well, they have the Korean Coast Guard, and that's what they do. Uh, yeah, the, the Korean Coast Guard's a big thing. It's it's, it's part of the uh, – it's not – I don't believe it's under the military. It's under the uh, police department, so they're like kind of marine police. Do not let him go. Do not let him go, okay? All right, that's the – that's the one. We, that's the one we. No, that's not the one we just watched. Okay, hang on here. What have I done? Hang on. Let's bring that up. I think that's what they want to do. Bigging it. Oh, 
Hold on. Oh. Okay, get him in board. Get him in board as quick as you can. Oh, they snagged him. Good. Oh. Even rescue dolphins. Hit, hit that back end up. Oh, that's some deep mud there. Oh, but nothing's got one. Oh, here we go. Boom. That's one we saw earlier. Oof. Those are some swells. Look at the, what's that fall? Ugh. Well, now, how did that happen? That raises questions. <laughs> oh, shit, he's got a baby, you dumbass. Good boy, good boy. Hey, Gigi, take care. Just take your time, take your time. Nice right, and careful. Okay, we'll get you on the... There you go, get yourself on there. Take a breath. Okay, okay. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, once you get down there. Right, can you come here, mate? Come here. Right, I've got your hands, good. Right, turn around, please. Turn around, turn around, please. Turn around, turn around. If you're out on the ocean, pay attention to the tides, people. Come on, no. Check your tide table. Make sure you don't get stuck out here like this. That's just dumb. That's just bad planning. Again, yeah, it was just cut off on the causeway. Just, I mean, how does it happen in that? Like, how do you let that happen to you? Uh, planning. Yeah, we'll do it. Yep. Oh, 
Looks like my cat's fine all by himself. He'll get there. No, don't need no stinking rescue. It survives this down job, isn't it? <laughs> that cat don't need no stinking rescue. Like the, uh, the yacht did a little dance with the with the other ship there. And this is all in one year, you know. And these are just the highlights. This happens all the time. There we go. Uh, nice and easy. All right. You want to lift back? Yeah. <laughs> I'll take one of you at a time, sir. Just jump on and grab. See the two top loops? Yeah, pull yourself up to the top. Oh, dude, are you? Is it that better not be a girl you're letting you're leaving behind? You guys okay? Yeah. Is it caught badly? Okay. Oh, no children. Chilling on an oil ring chain. Your other hand. Oh. Drop your phone, kid. It ain't that important. They do a lot of pet rescues. Come on, take care of your animals, people. Okay, just stay chilled out. No worries. Oh, there's some rough teeth. God, you can't see anything in that.
Oh, the dog is so you scared. Yeah, man. Oh. Where's your life jackets, guys? Come on. No life jackets. one we just watched earlier. Yeah. Toe in the yacht. And those are just again. That's just a few of the uh, few of the videos that show the the RNLI lifeboat crews in action. Everything from saving cats to to saving human lives. All volunteer, all at the risk of their own safety. Amazing people. Uh, and Jen sent a uh, sent me a tweet with an interview with the uh, with the helicopter pilot. In, there was a uh, in, involved with the Penley lifeboat disaster, Lieutenant Commander Russell. Uh, I'm going to reach out to the people that uh, uploaded the video uh, because it's a it's a full on production to see if I can get the permission to show it. Uh, if so, we'll we'll catch it in one of the one of the upcoming Maritime Mondays. We'll be back with a we're going to wrap this up here, but we'll be back with another Maritime Monday next week. Uh, thank you to the 278 of you that are still here watching this. We had a little over 300 at one point. Uh, it's always great to have you here on, on this little niche market of, of Maritime Monday. Tomorrow, don't miss it. We're going to get into some weird, weird stuff with uh, Clayton Eckerd and uh, the accusations by the woman we're calling Jane, no! who uh, has accused him of impregnating her with twins uh, by giving him a blowy. Somehow that impregnated her with twins, but uh, she got a new lawyer and suddenly mysteriously seems to no longer be pregnant and wants to withdraw the lawsuit. But he's saying, no, oh, no, 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 no. I want a declaration that you were never pregnant and or I was never the father. Uh, we're not going to let this one go. He's not letting her withdraw the lawsuit until he gets a, get some stuff out in deposition. We're going to be talking about that yeah great success tune in tomorrow we're gonna to be looking at some court documents that are filed in that case it's a wild wild case uh well rampaging noob no i would say no that can't happen uh she's saying it happened but she's the only one that's saying it happened and she's also allegedly accused two other people of of the same thing um yeah so <laughs> stand by <laughs> yay more cannibalism no david no no, you can't say that's can't. No. Ew. 
Oh, ew. But yeah, tune in tomorrow for that. The uh, Clayton Eckerd, Jane no! lawsuit. We're going to deep dive into as many documents as possible. Then we'll we'll finish it up on other streams. We're going to keep following this because this lady is out of her mind. You're not going to want to miss it. Uh, Wednesday, I'm going to have Maya Kowalski's lawyer, uh, Greg Anderson, on for a couple of hours. We're just going to talk about him, the case, and things like. And where do we go next? Where, what the status of things are? We're going to get. To, we're going to do a deep dive with Greg Anderson, Maya Kowalski's lawyer, on Wednesday. Thursday, we're going to continue with the closing arguments in the O.J. Simpson trial with Johnny Cochran resuming his position uh, at the at the podium giving his closing arguments. And then on Friday, do not miss Friday. Friday is what we like to call Effort Friday, where we just say Effort and we show whatever we want to show. We have we just talk about whatever we want. And I grift hard for for money. That's all. It's a, it's a good all all in fun griftathon where you send me your super chats. Every hundred bucks that comes in, we take a shot. We see how liquored up I can get. Um and we also have a great panel of guests. This time I'm calling it Legal Vice's Lady Bits. We're having an all-female panel, and a panel of just some amazing women. I'm scrolling down here to see where, here we are. The, the guest list for Friday. It's going to be on Friday evening U.S. time, starting at 7 p.m. and going until you run out of money or my liver dies or whatever. We'll see what happens. But seriously, just that, that's the one day a month we grift shamelessly so we don't have to do it the rest of the month. It kind of gets it all out of the way. and we, we just have a whole bunch of fun. Joining us is for our Effort Friday stream, the Legal Vices Lady Bits All Ladies Night Effort Friday Griftathon on the 19th of January, 7 p.m. Eastern again. Uh, Danny on direct will be here. Uh, our very own Mod Flux from House of Flux will be here. Uh, influencer Lauren De Laguna will be here. Steph the Alter Nerd. Uh, we, we all know and love Steph. Steph the Alter Nerd is, a, is great. She's funny. She covers Royals. Uh, she works with Popcorn Planet as well. Chandler Remington will be there as well. Uh, Little Miss Jacob, Ari Jacob, the influencer's influencer, the mover and shaker. The, she, she's the one that influences the influencers. She'll be here. Uh, Christina from Radix Verum will be here. Talk with Sally will be here. Sally, we, Sally's a, a she's a fixture on our Effort Fridays. Uh, Waifu Kron Jess will be here. She she's it's been a while since she's been on. Av to the seventh power, the lead attorney's co-host. She will be here, bringing some heat bombs and some truth bombs. I suspect Lady Law five seven nine one. She's a she's a, a quiet a quiet yet when she speaks she drops some. She dropped some heavy hammers. <laughs> Love Lady Law. She'll be here. Uh, comedian Lila Hart will be on the panel. And uh, top 0.1% OnlyFans model content creator, lawyer turned OnlyFans content creator, Jasmine Jafar will be here. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's what we've got so far. We may have a couple more people come in as as the evening goes on and whatnot. But th that's what we've got lined up for Friday. Don't miss that. That's going to be a bunch of fun. Just uh, bring bring your grift money. I'll have a couple of bottles of whiskey. Because what we do is like for the, the aggregates of $100, you know, the, the $5, $10, $20 Super Chats that add up to $100, we do like a lower tier. But if someone drops the $100 Super Chats, I do a shot of premium whiskey and it crushes my soul to, <laughs> to just shoot expensive whiskey. So that's that's kind of thing. It's just a fun griftathon. We we have a lot of fun with it. So bring bring your coins, your shekels, your dineros, your whatever you have, your sexy North Korean monies, and I'll bring the women. How does that sound? We'll have we'll have a good evening of good based discussions with women. And I, I assume that Andrew Branca will be will be lurking in chat, but we'll see. All righty, there we are. That's what we got coming up, and then we'll do another Maritime Monday next Monday. So, and there we go. Why am I so red? Am I red? I don't know. It could be the lights. Am I red? I don't look red. Hmm. Well, uh, then let's do this. We can just pump up the brightness a little bit there. Oh, have I not been on this thing? Hmm. Oh, well, that's interesting. Why did it? Huh. 
There's me in the dark and here's me. There we go. That's that's where we should be. Huh. I guess I was red because uh, there, there was a lot of... I didn't even notice the pink tones until someone mentioned it. This is, this is where we should be. Huh. All right. I guess it was just the lighting. I had to, had to reset it. Anywho, that's... <laughs> Now that, now that I fixed the lighting problem two hours and one minute into our two-hour show, there we go. I, I was just kind of chilling in the dark here. <laughs> All right, anyway, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. What we're going to do now is I'm going to kick you on over to Nick Starro. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll go hang out with him. Um, right, so everybody take care. Come back tomorrow for this weird case of the alleged twins coming from a, a night of oral pleasure. With Clayton Eckerd and Jane. No! <laughs> Until then, uh, take care, everybody. Enjoy your legal vices, and thank you for joining me for this very, very serious, uh, very, very in-depth look at the Penley lifeboat disaster. Until tomorrow, peace out, everybody. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. How are we doing? It is time. It's time for a new trial. I've been keeping this a little bit close to the vest. Defense made a motion for a mistrial. Prosecutor was up to some fuckery. Potentially damaging evidence. No basis for it. The judge specifically said, do not ask that question. Do not use that as evidence. She walked right down the path and asked the question. It may be over on Tuesday morning. Batman Bruce Wayne bitch snitch. Gerald yeah, Brooks, your constitution does not apply to me because I'm a sovereign citizen, a traveler on the land. I own the Norian Empire or whatever bitch said. Because there's something fucking absurd. If you want to be a sovereign citizen, just do yourself a favor first. Go to YouTube here and bitch again. Every sod of sovereign citizen has ever been Some clever dick on the internet didn't find the great loophole in all of the world's law. <laughs> Bitch snitch. God dang, you're right. God dang, you're right. Traveler on the land. Empire Traveler on the land Bitch Smith Moorish Empire God dang, you're right Traveler on the land Bitch Smith